We're exploring the winter garden both inside and out. The details coming up next. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. Now today, we're going to talk about the winter garden, and you may be thinking, well, what is there really to see in the garden during the winter? Well, actually, it's a great time to assess the framework of the garden, and if you want to make any modifications, well, it's the time of year most of your plants are asleep, and you can take advantage of that. In just a little while, we'll journey out to the garden home retreat and see how my brother and I are mixing holly hedges in two sizes to create a thicker garden wall. And we'll talk about this focal point that might be overshadowed in other seasons. Okay, why don't we move inside where it's a little warmer. I want to show you how to make some great little gardens that are perfect for indoors. Come on. You know, I have to say, I love gardens of all sizes. Even gardens that you can put in a jar this size. You know, when I was a kid, I always loved making terrariums. I'd put them in a mason jar, a fish bowl, even an aquarium. And I'd plant all sorts of plants in there. Some of them would work and some of them wouldn't. I'd put sticks and moss and rocks and even little plastic dinosaurs and things like that. I think terrariums can add a bit of nature in the house in a very beautiful and stylish way. So what I thought I would do today is talk just a little bit about the history of the terrarium and then some ideas on how you can create one for your own garden home. What's interesting about the terrarium is they really came about in the 19th century. One of the earliest examples is one called the Wardian case. This guy by the name of Ward in England developed a glass box and it was actually used in the beginning to transport tropical plants from all the various extensions of England's colonies back to Victorian England. And then from there the terrarium became all the craze. Now what I'm doing today is starting with some rather large jars. I find that those are a lot easier to work with. The larger the mouth of the jar, the easier it is to get your hands in. Now you can make terrariums with smaller mouth jars, but you'll need some little tools. Uh, sticks, chopsticks work very well, tweezers, whatever you need to get down there to plant the plants and get everything in place. Now I like to use lots of different shapes. You can see how I've displayed these on the end of the work table here. I've, they're all roughly about the same size, but I have them elevated using these shiny cake plates. It's nice because it reflects the light and the color of the plants and so forth. These can be great looking in a kitchen or even a bathroom. Now when you create a terrarium, the main thing to keep in mind is just have some fun. It should be a creative expression. All you need are a few basic elements. We've already established you need a container, of course. And then at the bottom of it, you're gonna put a gravel base. And those can be in any sort of shape and form. Just look at some of these big black ones, white ones, and these mixed ones here. And then after that, you're going to add a layer of good potting soil. Okay? Now why don't we get started? What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this gravel as the gravel for the base. Makes a lot of racket, doesn't it? So all I'm doing is I'm putting about a half inch gravel in here. And now I'm going to apply a layer of this potting soil like this. Just use a good high quality potting soil that has some nutrient in it because typically you don't fertilize these terrariums until about a year. And one tip to keep in mind to keep the soil off the edge of the glass is just take a spray bottle like this and you can rinse the inside of the jar. And after I plant my plants, I'll come back and give it another rinse to make sure again that there's no soil on the edge. Okay, now here's where you can really get creative. It's about choosing the plants, and there's a wide range of house plants you can use. 
What I like to go for are those that have a tropical quality. You don't want to use plants that love arid conditions like many of the sedums and cacti and so forth. It's a different kind of terrarium. These are going to be covered with glass. And you're going to be creating constant humidity within this jar. So stay away from those. I try to select plants that have small leaves and aren't particularly vigorous growers. Plants like some of the needle point ivies, the little tiny button fern, or strawberry begonia. I like peperomias as well as the phytonias, funny name, but it's also called a nerve plant, called that because of the veining that you see. The white ones are striking and there's a beautiful pink one that you can see that I've used in a number of these terrariums. And I've also coordinated the colors here, you can see. I've used the same plant palette in all five of these terrariums because I like showcasing them all together. So they hang together with their own color theme. Now, other ways that you can apply your own personal style to these is to think about the ground cover within the terrarium. I like to use mosses or even another kind of gravel to create a pattern. And then you can apply sticks or interesting stones and even lichens and other kinds of mosses. Now, a couple of tips you need to keep in mind. Placing this in the house is very important. You never want to put a terrarium in full hot sun because the temperature can really heat up in a hurry inside this jar. So keep it away from direct light. When it comes to water, what I do is make sure that the soil is moist and there might be just a little bit of water down here in the gravel. Put the lid on it and watch it for several days. If you get a lot of humidity and it begins to bead up, you may want to pull the jar lid over just to the side and let some of that water evaporate out. You just kind of have to monitor it for about a week to 10 days, and then you can keep the lid on it for months and months without any care at all. And what a beautiful way to bring a bit of the garden into your home. This is pretty exciting stuff. It's amazing how quickly this foam insulation goes up. And what I'm thrilled about is that it's made with soybeans. So it's made from a sustainable green product. Now, if you want to cut down on your carbon imprint, you have to make the right choices. And what we're doing here is choosing an insulation that is really exceptional. And it's going to keep the energy cost of this house over its entire life really, really low. So as time rolls on, the dividends just get better and better by using an insulation that's going to be here and be extremely effective. But what he's doing here is applying about five and a half to six inches of foam insulation on the wall. It hits the wall, reacts with the air, and expands out. These walls eventually will be 22 inches thick, has a brick veneer on it, several layers of wood, and then of course this insulation. And the reason for that is that we're trying to create a model of a new old house. And if you look at masonry houses from the 1830s, well, you get that thickness of wall. And so by building out the walls, filling with insulation, we're gonna get that look. It's pretty exciting stuff. My garden is constantly evolving and changing. And I'm not just talking about the waves of color from plants. I'm talking about what's below the surface. I'm always seeking out greener solutions, and by that I mean environmentally friendly ways of caring for the soil. So if I work this hard to create a green garden, why not an environmentally forward house too? When we began designing the Garden Home Retreat, I wanted to ensure that this house and garden would illustrate to visitors the latest innovations in thinking green. I employed simple solutions such as water conservation, tried out solar-driven products, chose materials with a history of performance such as brick, cypress wood, and metal roofing. And inside the house, I'm putting soybeans to work. Yes, the same soybeans you see growing in the fields throughout this country. Through a chemical process, these beans are transformed into a sprayable foam that makes an excellent insulation. Brian Rice tells us about some important points you may want to consider when insulating your home. Soy-based spray foam insulation is a two-component system. These two components are kept completely separate until the last half inch of the gun. That's where the two components mix together, hit the wall as a liquid, and expand up to a hundred times to seal any cracks, crevices, 
areas around pipes, windows, and doors that are your main concerns for air leakage. When discussing the pros and cons of fiberglass versus a soy-based spray foam insulation, the first thing I think of is with fiberglass it's definitely cheap to install and any insulation is going to be better than none at all for your home. The fiberglass insulation is cheaper up front and will provide some resistance to heat transfer but does not control the air infiltration being the main con of that product. The pros of the soy based spray foam is the air seal doesn't allow that air infiltration. One of the cons would be the higher upfront cost and the fact that trained professionals are needed to install that product versus where the fiberglass can be installed by any do-it-yourselfer out there. Although soy based spray foam insulation does provide a complete air seal itself, it is not a cure-all product. The house is a system and all the parts and pieces need to work together in order to create the total energy efficient package. Your HVAC unit, your window quality, door quality, and other ingredients that make up a home are going to give you that complete air seal and the energy efficient home that you're looking for. This time of year, my greenhouse is a very popular place. It's popular for all of my tropical and tender plants and anything that I'm starting from seed. And it's a popular place for me to hang out because it's the best place for me to get my hands in the soil and do a little gardening. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm getting ready to do uh, some lettuce planting. But I want to tell you that this greenhouse serves many purposes. I have several plants that I love to grow and have had for years, such as my Myers lemon, the bay trees I have here, and the agapanthus that I typically have blooming around the center circle here at the Garden Home Retreat. Now, what I'm doing today is I'm getting some little lettuce started. I'm using this one called Tom Thumb. It's a, one of the butterhead lettuces, which I absolutely adore. And what I'm doing is I'm going to drop just a couple of seed in each one of these little cell packs, okay? And all I do is just drop them in like this. You get the idea. And then I'll come back with just a quarter inch of soil over the top of them, all right? Water them in. In about 10 days, this will be solid green with little seedlings of lettuce. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind if you're growing some of your own vegetables. I like to recycle, but if you recycle some of these little cell packs, you want to make sure from season to season, you drop them into a solution of water and bleach. It takes just a little bit of bleach. So, in so say a number nine wash tub, fill it up, put about three tablespoons of bleach in there, and then you can drop these in for an hour or so, lift them out, rinse them off, and you've destroyed all the pathogens that might be on them. I also do that with my clay pots as well. Now, once these little lettuce plants come up, they get several leaves on them, I can transplant them out into the garden. And one way to help with that transition is to use a frost blanket. In fact, this past fall, late in the season, I planted lettuce, chard, even sweet peas, and covered them with a frost blanket. And it was amazing how long I was able to harvest vegetables in the garden. You see, the frost blanket gives these plants a little advantage, and so you can extend the growing season. Now, let me talk to you about a couple other little advantages that you may want to think about. You can see that I have these cell packs in this plastic saucer, if you will. What this does is it helps me hold moisture within this little compound, all right? Because consistent moisture is really important. What I have here are 72 little cell packs, so I'll have 72 little plugs of lettuce to put out in the garden. And then you can also find these uh, covers that can sit on top of it just like this, and this will also help raise the humidity uh, as the little seedlings come up, which is another advantage. So in effect, what you've done is you've created a little greenhouse within a greenhouse. Now, another thing I want you to think about is soil. You really need to use a good potting soil. In fact, there are soils blended for starting seedlings, and these make a lot of sense. So don't try to use soil out of the garden or even soil you used last year. It's best to start with fresh soil. If 
If you're like me, in the middle of winter, you start getting the urge to plant something, anything. And if you don't have a greenhouse, that can be a little tricky, particularly if you're wanting to sow seed. But there is an approach you can take, which can be a lot of fun. It's simply by simulating spring indoors. Now, there are two things you need to consider. One is light, and you can satisfy that with a grow light. And the other is you want warm soil temperatures. And the way to do that is just get one of these warming pads. It's connected to a plug. You just plug it in and you sit it inside this tray, which will hold some water. And you can't believe the warm weather vegetables and herbs and flowers that you can germinate. It just raises the temperature a few degrees, enough to get them started and well on their way before you send them out into the garden. Now what's great is that most garden centers and home improvement centers carry all of these supplies for starting seeds indoors. And you may be asking yourself, well, why don't I just go to the garden center and buy these plants already started in the spring? Well, I'll tell you the reason, is that many varieties of basil, like I'm planting here, tomatoes, peppers, you can't get in the nursery. Some of these heirloom varieties, you have to start from seed. If you want that extra special flavor throughout the summer and early fall from your garden, some of them you'll have to start from seed. Give it a try. It's really easier than you think. Winter really is a great time of year to take care of some of those projects you don't get around to doing during the spring and summer. For instance, here, this is a major focal point in the garden. We're down here on the west end, and as you come through that arbor, you see a circular bed. Now, under this plywood that I'm standing on, I've actually planted a lot of tulip bulbs, and I wanted to get this concrete plinth put in place. A plinth is just simply a structure that elevates an urn. We put this plinth in place so I can put that old cast iron urn here as the main focal point for this area. Now, what we did is we created a wood form, as you can see here, and Chris is adding just mixed concrete, but it's a very loose sort of slurry of concrete. And what I'm doing is I'm just tapping it along the side. You can see I've got the easy job. Just tapping it along the side to make sure that all the little air bubbles come to the top. Because when we take this concrete form off, I don't want it to have little air pockets and holes in the concrete. I want it to be as smooth as it possibly can. And once we take the forms off, which we can do tomorrow, what I'll do is then rub the sides of the concrete and I'm actually gonna paint it black to match the plinth and the urn that will sit on top of this concrete plinth. Now the thing I love so much about this particular urn is that it fits the period of time that we're creating here at the Garden Home Retreat. It's about an 1850s style urn, Greek Revival, has a beautiful egg and dart motif around the edge. It's a shallow taza shaped urn, which means that you can't put a plant in it that's going to be really, uh, that has a lot of deep roots. You're going to need something that can take dry conditions. So my plan is to fill it with some kind of a sedum, maybe a, a beautiful sort of blue spruce sedum will be perfect. And then around the bed, we have tulips in the spring, but throughout the seasons, we'll change it out. And given the size of the thing, it's going to be the perfect focal point for this area of the garden. Hi, welcome to my design studio. Now this is where we take photographs that you email in to me. And we take a look at them and talk about how we might improve your landscape. Today we've got a house in North Carolina. Diana's got some issues she wants to deal with and one of them is the fact that the house faces west so the front door gets really hot in the summer. Now it looks like that she's tried to plant some sort of shade here on this corner. Here's a couple of thoughts. First, pull a larger shade tree out like this, Diana. It would really give you some, some cover. Now, the shade tree could be a beautiful maple. Red maples grow fast, great fall color. It could be a willow oak. The leaf of a willow oak is very small, so it makes fall cleanup easy. Now, let's talk about the front itself. What I would like for you to do is think about a bed that would run right along your walkway like this, would come across the front and sweep around like this, 
and think about a hedge that might come down and around like so. Now, this will give you a little bit of privacy and it creates a bed space back here. So let's think about filling in behind this beautiful white pine with some maybe white rhododendron and then pull this bench out. I'd like to see it pulled up to the edge here and then let's accent each side of it with maybe a boxwood and then repeat that boxwood, that dense dark green across the front here on each side of the front door, here and here. And then what I'd like to do is do away with this planting here because it's blocking the front windows and really is out of proportion for the front. And let's underplant this with something like Dwarf Nandina. And let's do the same thing across the front here. Keep it low and then fill in with a ground cover uh, across the front like this. It could be Winter Creeper. That's a great one that can take full sun. Diana, those are just some ideas that I think will put you in good stead with your house. Good luck with the project. <music>You know, I talk a lot about the importance of framework and structure in a garden, and during the winter, well, it's the most obvious. If you've got good bones and a good framework, well, it's very obvious this time of year. Even though we're in the throes of construction, I've decided to get on with some of our hedge planting. And this is one of my favorite hollies. This is one called Needlepoint. Now, I've used it in lots of gardens I've designed. In fact, my garden in town, the entire fountain garden is surrounded by this particular plant. Now, we brought these large ones in, bald and burlap, meaning they were dug out of a field. Um, the roots were cut, they were wrapped with burlap and then shipped. And you can see they've lost some of their foliage and there's some spaces here between them. So to bulk up this hedge, I got some of these little five gallon ones and we're actually planting them in between and they'll fill in this space and help me create the solid green wall that I want so badly. You know, hollies are such an excellent evergreen and there's so many of them to choose from. Some of the favorites that I grow include Emily Bruner holly. And then a wonderful native holly is called Yopon holly with its mouse ear leaf and beautiful red berries. I also grow deciduous hollies, hollies that don't have any leaves on them in winter but are covered with gorgeous red berries. And then there's the savanna holly which I've got planted along the south side of my property, which makes a beautiful screening plant. So as you can see, there's lots of hollies to choose from. Now, one last thing I wanna point out about this hedge, these plants were bald and burlapped, as I mentioned, so the roots were cut. So the first year, they're going to sleep. The second year, they're going to creep. And in the third year, they will leap. Now, as opposed to these in containers, all of their roots are intact, so they will leap. So what will happen here is they'll fill in much quicker than you think. Now, in about another month, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna shear these and cut them back and shape them up. So as soon as those buds begin to swell in the spring, they'll begin to fill in beautifully. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and seen all the beauty that you can enjoy during the winter. And there's lots you can be doing in the garden, anticipating spring. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.